All right. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday, Ben. Happy Friday. Yeah. Thanks for jumping on. I'm excited to kind of announce what you and I have been working a lot on over the last couple of weeks. We've got some exciting stuff around the bend here, especially going into the 2024 year with it's hopefully being a little bit more transparent public with um, some of our conversations we're having about the market and just all sorts of um, topics when it comes to self-improvement and real estate and just a lot of other fun stuff too. So um, again, guys, a lot more to come on that, but today we just wanted to jump on for maybe 10 minutes and just talk about a topic that's definitely um, coming up a lot in both of our circles, which is just about the current rates for mortgages. Um, you know, it's been obviously a pretty crazy past six months and we're starting to see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, maybe. So I'm um, excited just to have Ben talk about a little bit of that in more depth, being the expert that he is. Um, ben, the I guess the first thing is just talking about um, how in the last week or so, the Fed has been hinting at, uh, Powell hasn't been saying this publicly yet, but he's actually been kind of cautioning people, but just the um, possibility going into 2024 that we're going to have up to maybe four or even six rate drops um, totaling maybe around one and a half percent. So just kind of curious um, from your perspective, um, you know, what you think about all that. Yeah, um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. There have been a lot of bank analysts from large financial institutions, big banks, investment firms that have come out just here in the last couple of weeks and commented that their economists, their analysts are anticipating uh, four to six uh, rate drops in 2024. Um, now, the Fed, as you mentioned, has not mentioned that. That has not been their tone or their language. Um, they have you know, advised everyone to stay cautious, but that's kind of the overall sentiment um, as inflation continues to tame and, um, you know, some of these economic uh, numbers continue to stabilize. And it's definitely something that's needed. You know, when you look at the past 24 months where we were at at the beginning of 2022 with interest rates, you know, right around 2.99, we actually peaked at 8% plus about four weeks ago. And that is an incredible jump up in a very short period of time. And especially when you have higher markets like Denver, where values are high, um, our average sales price is high. And then, you know, when you factor in higher interest rates, it really impacts affordability, especially for first time home buyers. And so that is, you know, some of the challenges that this market is facing in other markets, you know, that aren't as highly priced as Denver, you know, markets in the Midwest, um, some of those concerns aren't quite as pronounced, but you know, nationwide, generally speaking, a reduction in rates uh, is is definitely going to be welcome. And that is, you know, this, this housing market has just kind of stalled. Uh, you know, from a selling buying perspective, it's been very challenging. So, hopefully, that's uh, you know that'll happen, and uh, I'm I'm hoping for the same things. So, you expecting that first rate drop to be sometime maybe in January or? Like when, when do you uh, foresee some momentum happening when it comes to seeing some lower rates and just more activity when it comes to people getting off the sidelines? Yeah, you know, from a seasonal perspective, December and January seasonally are typically the slowest times of year from a selling and purchase perspective. In regards to your question about rate drops, um, I would anticipate sometimes towards the end of first quarter uh, start of second quarter, the Fed is going to continue to monitor this economic data. Um, you know, so a lot of it has been improving, but that'll, you know, we, we are in December right now and uh, January is right around the corner. So that that's what I would anticipate. That's what I would expect. Um, and that's also what I'm, what I'm hopeful for. I know you've made uh, some comments over the last few weeks about, um, I'm not sure what data there is behind this, but just about election years and how um, typically in an election year, you see even more um, potential drops in rates and just a little bit more um, volatility when it comes to rates on those election years, which we have obviously coming up in 2024. Yeah, you know, 2024 is going to be a really big year for a lot of different reasons. And there's a lot of different factors that can impact interest rates. Um, we have 
domestic economic factors like we've experienced with housing, inflation, uh, still you know, feeling the effects of COVID a little bit. We have geopolitical factors, you know, what's going on in the Middle East, Russia, all of that can uh, impact our domestic economy. Um, you know, interest rates. We also have the election coming up as well later this year. That, that's going to be a big talking point um, for, for both sides of the aisle. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out um, uh, as we move forward into 2024. That's really good advice. Um, so just kind of one other question I wanted to just chat with you for a minute about today. Um, a lot more to come, obviously, after today, when we'll get a little bit more in depth on some of these really important topics going into next year. Um, but just talking about, you know, right now I've got a lot of uh, just clients and friends that I've been helping out with looking at homes, you know, going into the end of the year, specifically with new build communities and how, you know, new builders are kind of like a kind of like a car dealership where they have this inventory that they need to get off their books before the end of the year. So they're offering additional incentives and really leaning into the marketing of lower interest rates and some of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so kind of a two-part question. We'll go in more into like the, how they're offering that here in a second, but um, what's your suggestion for people that maybe are ready to get off the sidelines and start actively looking for a home, but they're just not interested in the new build communities. So, you know, a home that's 20, 30 years old, um, you know, are they still able to get some pretty um, reasonable rates or some creative financing options to still make that a reality, even if they aren't, again, steering towards the new builds? Yeah, you know, that's another great question. And I always advise folks to do what they feel is in their best interest. I'm not one of these mortgage professionals or real estate professionals that is telling people to buy, buy, buy. Um, I really want every individual to do what they feel is in their, you know, their best and their family's best financial interest. My job as a mortgage professional is to give them the data and the information um, so they can make an informed financial decision. I'm never going to put any pressure on anyone. I want to be able to empower them, give them the information, let them know what their down payment's going to look like, their financing terms, their payment. Um, that is a great point, though. You know, what are some creative options? And right now, you know, one thing about this market that is a plus for buyers is they do have a lot more leverage than they've had in years past. They are able to negotiate uh, for the seller to pay for a 2-1 buy down or a 3-2-1 buy down. I have a transaction that's going to be closing here in the next couple of weeks and the seller is contributing um, you know, a very large concession so the buyer can do a 3-2-1 buy down. And what's great about the temporary buy downs versus a permanent buy down is that it's more of a subsidy. So if the seller contributes 17000 for example, for a 3-2-1 buy down, number one, the buyer is going to have an interest rate that is three full percentage points lower in year one. So if the note rate is 6.99, well, in year one, it's going to be 3.99, year two, 4.99, year three, 5.99, and then it'll mature starting in year four at the 6.99. But what's great about the temporary buy down is that, you know, that 17,000 that the seller is contributing, that's actually placed in the buyer's escrow account. And so if interest rates do come down organically over the next 6, 12, 24 months, and that buyer wants to refinance, well, whatever the prorated balance is in that escrow account from the buy down, they get all of that money back. And so they don't have to feel uh, upset or discouraged if they want to look at a refinance and take advantage of you know, locking in a permanent lower interest rate because that money would then be credited to them, subtracted directly off of the principal balance, or they would just get a check back for whatever you know, the prorated balance is. So that's what I love seeing because it's not uh, costing the buyer anything. There's no, uh, you know, the, the opportunity cost. You know, with, with a permanent buy down, that's a fixed cost. So if someone buys the interest rate down, they pay 10,000. Well, that's, a, that's an upfront cost. That's an APR item. And then if interest rates come down, you know, six months later, well, that ten thousand is is gone. Mm -hmm. um, it works the opposite with the temporary buy downs. So, how come we don't hear more about three two one buy downs? You know, I, I feel like two one buy down is such a kind of a not clickbait, but it's a very common term you're seeing a lot. Um, three two one, 
very, pretty uncommon. In fact, when we were talking about that at the gym earlier, I um, really hadn't heard that in the last couple of months. Um, just what, what's the reasoning? Is it a lot more difficult to qualify for that? Or are there some restrictions or what's the, it's it just not um, just kind of at first thought, it seems like why wouldn't everybody want to have a three, two, one instead of a two, one, if it's making that rate even lower for the first year. And it is, you know, most people hopefully are optimistic knowing that in two or three years from now we'll be at or below, you know, hopefully at 5%, you know, whatever it may be, but it just seems like that's a no brainer for everybody to, to lean into a three, two, one instead of a two, one. Yeah, that's another great question. Um, and a great talking point, not, you know, and to answer that, not every bank offers a three, two, one. So there's actually several different types of buy downs. There's a one Oh buy down. There's a two, one buy down. And then there's also a three, two, one buy down. So not every bank or financial institution is going to carry that product in their portfolio. So they're not actually going to have the means to do that. Um, at North Point, that is a product that we offer. So that's point number one. And then point number two is that it does require a larger contribution from the seller. Um, on that example that I was explaining earlier, a 2-1 buy down, the subsidy for that was around 10,000. To get the 3-2-1 buy down, the subsidy was around 18,000. So for that extra year, the buy down subsidy almost doubles. And the reason for that is because not only is the interest rate going, you know, a whole point lower than the two one buy down, but there's also an extra year that it's going uh, temporary lower as well. So, okay. so it does take a little more negotiation and skill on the agent's behalf. And it also just depends on where the seller is at. Um, so the, the, the two, one buy down doesn't require as much from the seller, the three, two, one buy down requires more. So that's probably also, I've, I've been looking more specifically at the new construction, the builders recently, and if it's more upfront for them, and I'm guessing their in-house lending that they're usually requiring it to go through for those, they're probably examples of, um, lenders that don't even offer that I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So when it comes to a buyer and just their credit score and being able to qualify for their loan, are there additional restrictions if a three, two, one or a two, one buy down is being applied? Is that more difficult to qualify for a loan if that's being provided or not since it's coming from a different source? Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, from a conventional perspective, the customer is always going to be qualified at the note rate. And so if the note rate is 6.99%, even though that interest rate in year one would be 3.99%, they still get qualified off of the 6.99%. And then on conventional loans, there's other factors that go into calculating uh, the interest rate and the financing terms, and those would be down payment. Um, on a conventional loan, the minimum down is 5%. There are some conventional loan programs that will allow for as little as 3% down. Those are typically income restricted to 80% of the area median income. Uh, but then there's other factors like, you know, what is the debt to income ratio? What is the credit score? And this is what a lot of folks don't always understand where your credit score really does matter now more than ever. Um, here in the last 12 months, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have both updated their guidelines with respect to credit. Prior to 2023, the top credit score was 740. So if you had a 740 or above, you were considered A++ from a credit rating perspective. Well, they have now adjusted that top tier to 780 plus. So that was one of the big changes that happened this year. So the top tier is 780. And then from there, it's 20, uh, 20 point increments that go down. So tier two would be 760 to 779. Tier three is 740 to 759. So based on the overall uh, qualifying of the entire, you know, customer's application, as far as down payment, debt to income, reserves, it can really determine what their interest rate is going to be, as well as their purchasing power. Just kind of a side note, we'll talk about this here in a second when we close this out, but um, you've been doing a ton of uh, work on your YouTube channel recently and adding a lot of value to people with... Um, lots of different topics, but especially um, related to this, just how to improve your credit score. Um, you know, you got what almost 20 years or more now of experience with just in the banking industry where I know you have a ton of uh, value and just how many people um, you've seen over the years, different scenarios. Um, 
but just maybe tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that too, just about uh, a couple of those resources that maybe people can find online if they're maybe in a position where they are, you know, ready to buy, but a little bit concerned about their credit score and, um, you know, just have that as a, maybe a, a barrier to entry for themselves with, you know, taking the leap and trying to move forward with buying their, maybe their first home. Yeah, you know, that's another great question. And that's one thing that I love about my job is that I, I've always said that I get to look into the window of the American economy. Um, I get to see what the American consumer is up to. I get to see what they're spending their money on, how they're managing their credit. And one of my criticisms of our education system is that we don't have any education. We, ne we never educate anyone on, on any of this stuff. Um, how to manage your credit, how to be fiscally responsible, what steps you can take to put yourself in the very best position to not only qualify for a home, but live a financial life where you are able to do the things that are important while also building for the future. Um, in, in regards to credit, I see a lot of Americans and American consumers making uh, you know, the, the same mistakes and it surrounds you know, not managing credit cards correctly, taking on too much consumer debt. And all of these things can impact your credit score. I'm going to be releasing a new video next week um, on my YouTube channel, which is American Money 101, where we talk about, you know, exactly that, how to improve your credit score, the six steps you can take to improve it to over 800. And I, that's what I do every day. I get to review credit. I know the credit bureau scoring model. Um, I, you know, have been given access to all of this. So there are certain things that everyone can do, and there's things that need to be avoided if you want to obtain the perfect credit score. Just kind of curious, you know what the average credit score is for the an American? Like what the just the average credit score is? Yeah, over the last couple of years, the trend of data tells us that it's um, it's been around six eighty to seven hundred. Okay. And, okay. you know, it's, it's not uncommon to see scores above 700. It's not uncommon to see scores below 700. Um, to get a score above 800, you have to be very intentional with what you're doing, with how you're managing your credit, because that really is considered pristine. Um, but, you know, one thing I always encourage folks to remember is that it's not just about the score. It's about what's on the credit profile. Uh, what, you know, what are the debts? Uh, what type of debts do you have? What is the age and diversity of one's accounts? What does the payment history look like? All of these things factor in, in regards to a mortgage pre-approval. And to your second point there, you know, I, I consider myself, my, my formal title is a mortgage loan officer, but I consider myself more of a mortgage planner. I want to help people plan for the biggest investment and the biggest purchase of their life. The mistake that I see a lot of home buyers make, and especially first time home buyers, is a lot of times there's not a lot of planning in, in place. Um, a, a lot of times it's simply driving by a home or going to an open house. And then it's like, we went to this open house, I wanna write an offer. Well, you know, ha have you thought about your down payment? Have you thought about what you're comfortable as far as your monthly payment? Um, is your credit in a spot that is going to put you in the best position from a qualifying perspective? So I always encourage everyone um, to, you know, when they get really serious, three to four months out from when their targeted purchase is going to be to contact a real estate professional and a mortgage professional and start that conversation. Have your credit pulled, uh, get formally pre-approved. Just so you know where you stand, what you're going to qualify for, what products and programs you might be eligible for. You just don't want there to be any surprises, mm -hmm. uh, especially navigating through this for the first time and you know making the biggest purchase of, of one's life. So scenario here, let's just pretend that I'm looking at buying a house spring of 2024, start talking to you today, and my credit mm -hmm. score is a 650. And really in order to even qualify or to get, you know, add a monthly payment that makes sense, I need to get up to a, maybe a 750 or 725 or, you know, something fairly significantly higher than what I currently have. I know that every mm -hmm. scenario is different, but is there a kind of a, a rough um, guideline or estimate on like, how, is that even possible? Like how, how quickly can a credit score be improved if people are very intentional about, you know, following the right steps that you're providing them and, you know, making a 
a, you know, a serious effort towards improving it? Yeah, that, you know, that's another great question. Um, a lot of lenders, North Point included, we have some credit tools that we can run for our customers. And, you know, if, if they're at a 660 right now and the desired target range is to get it up to a 720, we have the ability to run a tool uh, to let them know what steps and what actions they need to take to get their score up to 720. And so it's, it's a great tool. It's a credit analyzer tool that is provided through the credit bureaus. Most lenders have access to this. And it's really something that you want to do, especially if your down payment is less than 40%. Once you hit that 40% mark loan to value ratio, because the down payment is so high and the equity is so high, um, the actual credit score matters less. But if you're putting less than 40% down, you really want to position your credit to put yourself in the very best position possible because it is going to impact closing costs, interest rate, financing terms, what you are going to be eligible for, you know, your purchasing power. And that that's always my suggestion. Like, you know, and that's a great point. Let's start that conversation now. If you're thinking about buying in March or April, let's start that conversation now so we can put a plan together and start working towards getting the credit improved. Um, a lot of times, you know, sometimes it depends on why the score is low. There, there's, you know, there's several different reasons sure. that one can, you know, ha have a low score. It could be, you know, insufficient payment history, derogatory accounts. Um, one that Americans really struggle with is credit utilization from their credit cards. And a lot of Americans don't know this. And I am always preaching about this. When it comes to credit utilization, it's known to the the credit bureau term is, you know, it's kind of a scientific term, it sounds like. It's called the utilization of revolving accounts. And most Americans don't know how this works. But if you have a credit line of 10,000, you will actually start to get dinged on your credit score once that balance goes over 10% of the actual credit line. So if, you're ba if your limit is 10,000 and your balance exceeds 1,000, your score will start to go down. Um, and it is, and if it, if, if it exceeds 30%, it will start to go down significantly. Most Americans have no idea about this. I see folks all the time on their credit cards, they'll carry, you know, their credit utilization will be 50, 60, 70% or more of what their credit limit is. And that absolutely destroys your score. So just managing your credit cards correctly, keeping that utilization rate under 30%, ideally under 10% can make a huge, huge difference in credit score. That's also one reason why someone should never turn down a credit line increase from their bank. If the bank is going to give you, you know, more credit or if they're going to increase your credit line, you want to accept that. Sure. It makes sense. Yeah. Cause then that 10% or whatever it is, is obviously a larger amount. Um, so when they're pulling that utilization, that's, if I have a $10,000 credit limit on my card and my payment due date is the first of every month, if I have a 50% of the 10th, if I have $5,000 balance right now for the next two weeks until the end of the month, that's not dinging me. It's just at that due date at the end of the month. If at that point it's above 10%, it's not like on a revolving daily basis. It's at the end of the, the current month. Is that how that's working? Yeah, that, that's, that's another interesting point. And this is another topic that a lot of Americans don't understand that um, the creditor, so say that you have a credit card through Visa, through your bank, they are actually going to report to the credit bureaus twice per month, not just once. A lot of folks think that it's one time per month. It's actually twice. And so if you're carrying, even if you pay your credit card off in full every month, you know, even if you pay off that balance in full and you're not actually carrying over a balance and, you know, it's possible to have a utilization rate above 30 percent and pay your balance off in full every month and not get charged any interest. I was just speaking with a customer last week. He's self-employed. He has several credit cards that have limits of 40, 50, 60,000, and he runs his business off of that. And he will put very large uh, purchases on those cards. He pays them off every month. He's not getting charged interest, but because these creditors are reporting to the credit bureaus twice per month, his score was about 150 points lower than what it should have been, even though he didn't have any late payments on any account ever. And it's because of the way that he was managing his credit cards. Wow. 
Yeah, that was one uh, tip that I got from watching one of your um, YouTube videos recently on credit cards on just understanding that it's actually a value to have multiple credit cards. Like I always thought, you know, the less um, credit cards I had that was showing that I wasn't, you know, you, th you see these people that have, you know, they open up their wallet and they've got 10 credit cards falling out of their wallet or their purse. And I always kind of looked at that as a negative. And for a lot of cases, it probably is because they've got high balances on all 10 of those cards. But there is some strategy and some value to having multiple credit cards as long as you're financially responsible with all of them. That's exactly right. And that's the big thing as long as you are financially responsible. Listen, I've seen folks have li literally 30 or 40 credit cards and in-store charge cards. And I'm always like, wow. how do you stay organized and make payments on all of these? Um, my personal strategy is I have four or five credit cards that I use. You have the individual credit utilization. So, you know, th that's what we were just talking about a moment ago, the individual card. So if the card has a $10,000 limit, you know, you want to keep that individual card, the credit utilization under 10%. But there's also the global credit utilization. And then this is what folks don't realize. It's not just the individual card. It's the total of all your credit cards. And so say, for example, someone has five credit cards, they each have a $10,000 balance or a $10,000 limit, their global credit would be 50,000. And you want to keep that global credit utilization from all the cards under 5,000. So that is why you want to have multiple cards. So you don't put too much of a balance on one card specifically to where it would exceed one of those ratios. And I, you know, go find four or five or three or four credit cards that offer great rewards. They're out there that offer awesome consumer protection. Stay away from the in-store charge cards. You know, the in-store charge cards can only be used at that individual store. Um, if you have a superior credit card, it's going to offer awesome consumer protection. The benefits or the rewards are going to be as good or better than the in-store charge cards. And you're going to have the flexibility to use that everywhere yeah that's great cool man well those are i think we got covered at least a few pretty uh good topics and i think on a lot of those have um some additional stuff to chat about maybe on our one of our next uh chances that we're together so you obviously have a ton of value when it comes to financial advice and just um these little things that even people that are pretty aware of their finances and intentional about you know doing a good job with their credit cards and um, financially responsible still. I mean, I'm, I'm learning new things all the time just through uh, our conversations and definitely also through that YouTube channel. So I think uh, with that, let's, uh, let's close it out today. But uh, any last words before we, we close out? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. And you're putting some great content out there. And I, I was just going to ask you um, about some of the new construction stuff. I've seen you going to um, a lot of, uh, just different new construction sites with different builders um, up north, out west. What are you seeing from um, you know some of the the new construction stuff, and and how great are these financing terms that some of these builders are offering? Because there does seem to be a lot of buzz around the financing terms that they're offering. And you know, let's face it, in Denver right now, there is a little bit of an affordability crisis. So, what are you seeing in regards to that? Yeah, that seems to be the the number one um marketing tool that most builders are using is you know if you're driving by different communities it's you know the the flags and the different signage out front you know mortgage rate uh you know uh, as low as 4.75 or whatever it may be but um mm -hmm. when i was out at one last week up in erie colorado the salesperson at the builder you know they had dropped the uh, they had said to us, you know, a 3.99. And that really piqued my interest just because I hadn't heard a number that low in quite a long time. And just talking through that a little bit with you, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that most likely was a kind of a combination of two things. It was probably that 2-1 buy down. So there was two points taken down for that first year. But even mm -hmm. still, that would only put as 3.99, 4.99, 5.99 it's still lower than what the rates are at right now. So that was probably an example of a um, concession being provided at closing. Maybe that would be that maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 range um, to get that one point dropped. And then off of that, 
the two point for the two the two one buy down. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, the, the new construction is just definitely something I think people need to consider and at least um, go out and, and check one out in person. There's you know pros and cons with every type of um, you know single family purchase. You know, new construction, you're moving into something that's brand new. I think one challenge recently is just um, you go into a new new construction development. Most likely, they're going to have a model home to see. You take your clients into the model home, and obviously, the builder wants to do everything they can to present the best possible product they can. Um, and that mm -hmm. that goes both for the interior, where you're seeing a floor plan or a, a type of a home that is, for example, maybe advertised at five hundred and fifty thousand. However, the model that you're walking through has, you know, an additional patio. They've got a fancier glass pantry door. They've got a, a second fireplace. All these add-ons, where the model mm -hmm. you're seeing might actually be a six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar home, and you got to be conscious yeah. of that because you take your clients into the sales office. They see that initial base price, similar again to a car with all without all the bells and whistles. And, you know, that fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 um, all of a sudden puts them out of their price point. Um, you know, so there's some of that going on and also just the physical location of the home. Um, we've had a few different scenarios recently where we go into a, a builder community, tour the model home. The backyard is fairly, um, you know, nice and, you know, it's got a decent amount of grass and good mm -hmm. lot location. And then you go into the office again and, it's probably also because it's the end of the year and they're trying to get these last little bit of um, inventory off their plate. But you, you go into the office, they show you the site map of where the actual home is that they're trying to sell. And it's on this, you know, yeah. super narrow, maybe like a triangle lot with very small backyard. Um, so I know I kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there, but the uh, yeah, with new construction, there's definitely a lot of just little things like that that need to be, um, you know, you need to be aware of both as an agent, but also as a potential buyer, just knowing that you have to dig a little deeper to make sure that what you're actually getting is what you're expecting. Um, I would just hate for a client and to a contract and, you know, two weeks before closing, do their, you know, one of their final walkthroughs and be like, wait a minute, where's this or where's that? Or, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's why I always advise buyers to have a real estate professional representing them when they go to new, you know, a new construction site, uh, when they go look at these you know, builders. Because when you have a builder that controls all the pieces of the pie, when they control the build, the home, the title, the lending, and then they have a salesperson there, well, who is looking out for the buyer's best interests? Sure. You know, and then some of the things that you described, that you described, you know, the lot, the upgrades, making sure that all of that stuff is completed. And sometimes to be frank, you know, there's tough conversations that need to be had. Uh, if the biller's not following through with, you know, what they said or the timelines or the upgrades. And that's why having a real estate professional doesn't cost the buyer anything more whatsoever on, on new construction. And you really want someone representing you, representing your interest. And if you need to have those tough conversations, most buyers aren't going to have the knowledge or the skills to do that. And so you want someone, you know, representing you, advocating for you uh, to have those conversations and, mm -hmm. and, you know, negotiate that stuff. Yep. Very good point. And if anybody's listening or watching this today and are considering new construction, maybe you don't have an agent yet. When you go in, just put somebody's name down, put my name down, put a friend of yours. If you have a, just know somebody that's a realtor, just to at least create that precedence on day one, because if you don't do that and two weeks later you come to your friend or you come to me and you really like this specific community as an agent, I'm no longer able to represent you because you've already created that initial relationship directly with the builder, with that salesperson. So um, you know, just again, since Ben just mentioned as well, that it doesn't cost the buyer anything. The commission's paid by the seller, by the builder. So, you know, there's really no downside, no reason not to be represented. And um, just kind of be aware of that. If you guys are going into a new construction community, just, you know, ideally put, you know, a friend or somebody that you know's name down. And even if that person needs to change in a week or two and you end up putting, you know, you can't, can't think of anybody's name, you put my name down and you end up actually having a you know, brother-in-law or somebody else that's a realtor, you want to use them. 
it's okay to change that down the road, but as long as, long as it's not setting the precedence with the actual builder as the person that's maybe going to be representing you. So just a little tip on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So cool, man. Well, Ben, yeah, you got a ton of great insight and um, really excited to kind of continue doing this with you. I know the guys we mentioned at the very beginning of this as a little teaser, there's a lot more to come with this and we're going to be um, a little bit more officially announcing this here in the next uh, couple weeks. It's been a, a quarter one of 2024 goal of ours to be consistent about coming out with more content and especially leaning more into the podcast um, forum just as this conversational back and forth um, type of uh, communication I think is really helpful for myself, for Ben, and I think hopefully a few of you guys, if you're getting any value from this, um, feel free to reach out to us or leave a comment below. And um, if you have any specific questions that you want Ben's um, help answering or myself, or even just topics that you would like to see on a future uh, podcast, leave that info down below too. And we'd love to explore whatever that may be with you. Cool, Ben. Happy Friday, buddy. Okay. Hope you have a great Thank weekend. You. Likewise. Have a great right. Friday. Yeah, we'll catch you next time. Okay. Thank you.